Greetings, family. This is you, the Yasharel. We're going to talk about the book of Revelation. Why? Well, we're going to see if it's true or false. Now, we know if we take J.C. out of the New Testament, that whole book is null and void. It's useless. J.C. is the backbone of the New Testament. So if we take him down, the whole book crumbles. So we're going to go through a series of scripture. We're going to be going back and forth from New Testament <coughs> to Old Testament to prove our point. You know, earlier today, I felt like, um, and I, I felt like this quite a few times, when I don't get something from the Most High in the way of a lesson, I start to feel like something is wrong. Maybe, uh, I don't know, he's not in touch with me or... I'm not in touch with him. Did I lose favor in his sight? <clears throat> you know, I, I start wondering all this crazy stuff. And some of you guys probably know what I'm talking about. You probably felt like that. You know, from time to time, you wonder, are we still in his grace? Or are we still uh, in his favor? Anyway, that's kind of what led me to this lesson. Uh, as I was wondering and feeling these things, all of this stuff started coming to me. So I picked out one of what I think is the most fundamental of the New Testament. And I say one of the things, not, not the most, but one of the most fundamental parts of the book of Revelation or the New Testament. <clears throat> So I started with the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 1, and it's only found in the New Testament. This stuff that I'm going to show you is only found in the New Testament. And at the end, I have some very interesting articles <clears throat> that I want to share with you guys. And I mean, it was like, what? I couldn't believe what I read. But anyway, we're going to go through this. And this may take some time. So I'm going to take my time and go through it. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. And I did this using several versions. New International. New Living Translation. English Standard. Berean Study Bible. New American Study Standard Bible, NASB. And I probably didn't have to use all these because they all say the same thing, just slightly different. But the, but the, uh, the message is the same. <clears throat> so I had a lot more up here than that. And I mean, it was a bunch of them. I took down most of them uh, because it just didn't really make sense to keep repeating the same things over and over. I just wanted to illustrate how all of these versions are supporting a false book. Okay, so, all right. So, back up to Revelation, <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse 1. The Revelation from J.C., which the Most High gave him, and I want y'all to really listen to these words now, which the Most High gave him to show his servants, okay? <clears throat> so J.C. has servants. We're going to discuss that a little later on which the Most High gave him to show his servants what must soon, this is very important right here, 
which must soon take place. Now this is JC claiming that the Most High gave him a prophecy or a revelation of what must soon. Now we know what soon is, must soon take place. And it says, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. All right. First of all, <clears throat> this prophecy is over 2,000 years old. So what is the problem with must soon take place? This should have already taken place. Not 2,000 years from now, right? I believe if the Most High was prophesy or giving somebody a prophecy, he would have been more specific as he is in the Torah. <clears throat> but here it says, what must soon take place? That means very quick, like, as we all know, 2,000 years later, it hasn't happened. So this is a lie. And it goes down through all these different translations. New Living Translation, this is a revelation from JC, which the Most High gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. Now, he even sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to skip the rest of these because they all say the same thing. New American Standard Bible. The revelation of J.C., which the Most High gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. His bond servant, John. So like I said, I'm going to skip these versions because, like I said, they all say the same thing. Now this one I'm going to read because I have a point to make. This is God's Word translation. This is the revelation of J.C. <clears throat> the Most High gave it to him to show his servants the things that must happen soon. He sent this revelation through his angel to his servant, John. All right. Now, <clears throat> this was the revelation of J.C. who said that the Most High gave him this. Well, in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8, the Most High says, I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory, which is his power, will I not give to another. Well, didn't somebody say he gave it to JC up here? Okay, so who's lying? Both of these can't be true. Somebody is lying. And it looks like J.C. Because he said the Most High gave it to him. This revelation. <clears throat> well, the Most High says, I am the Lord. This, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Now, in Matthew 22 and 18, J.C. says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. <clears throat> okay. What did the Most High say? I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory, which is his power, will I not give to another. But J.C. said, 
that it was all given to him. In heaven and in earth. <clears throat> now, the Most High made a promise in Amos 3 and 7. And this is the promise. I got it in the King James and then I also have it in the Septuagint. So let's read the King James Version first. This is Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Surely the Most High will do nothing. But he revealeth, that means his secret unto his servants, the prophets. <clears throat> that means that if he's going to do something on that kind of a scale, he's promising the prophets. I'm going to tell you first. I'm not going to do it and then tell you later. I'm going to tell you first. In the Septuagint, <clears throat> it says, For the Most High will do nothing without revealing instruction to his servants, the prophets. Now, if anybody can find any of the prophets speaking prophecy clearly pointing to the bringing in the JC. You know, none of the prophets knew him, never heard of him, never spoke of him. Although Christians have uh, tried manipulating scripture to say that it was a prophecy pointing to the coming of J.C. Which, if you read and understand the scripture, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Nehemiah, none of them are prophesying J.C. In fact, I did a lesson some while back proving that uh, J.C. had nothing to do with these prophecies. Okay, so here it is in the New Heart English Bible. Like I said, I'm going to skip these. I'm going to skip these. Now, this is <clears throat> the Bishop's Bible. Are y'all familiar with the Bishop's Bible? That's the King James. It was called the Bishop's Bible first. There's a long story with that, which I'm not going to get into right now. But the Bishop's Bible, that's what it was called. It says pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> but in Isaiah 49 and verse 3, this is what the Most High said. And said to me, because up here, J.C. said he had servants. You know, right here. Uh, yeah, right here. And I'm going to show you some more of his servants, too. <clears throat> J.C.'s claiming to have servants. But none of these servants were ever mentioned in the Torah. But these are the servants that was mentioned in the Torah. Isaiah 49 and verse 3. And said to me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, and in thee I will be glorified. Now that's the only servant so far. Isaiah 49 in verse 6, and he said to me, it is a great thing for thee to be called my servant. He's talking to Israel still. To establish the tribes of Jacob and to recover the dispersion of Israel. Behold, I have given thee for the covenant of a race. Now, a covenant is an agreement. It's like a contract. 
Now, we know the Most High does not break contract. For a light of the Gentiles. Thou shouldest be for salvation to the end of the earth. <clears throat> That's all the way to the end of what we live in right now. So, if he made a contract with Jacob, which we see he did, he established a covenant calling Jacob, which is all of Israel, his servant to the end of the earth. Now, wouldn't this have been a good time to mention these other servants that J.C. claimed that he was given? If I remember correctly, when I used to be in the New Testament, <clears throat> J.C. went around picking his disciples. You remember that? Remember him going to uh, the sea where all the fishermen were and he was picking out all those that he wanted to follow him? Okay. Well, Isaiah 49 and verse 8 says this. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee. And in a day of salvation have I succored thee, and I have formed thee and given thee for a covenant of the nations to establish the earth and to cause to inherit the desert heritages. What does that got to do with J.C.? Now remember what I said in the beginning. If you take J.C. out of the equation, there won't be a New Testament because J.C. is the backbone of the New Testament. So we're going to take him out. See what happens. Verse 26. And they afflicted thee and they that afflicted thee shall eat their own flesh. <clears throat> we know he's talking about the other nations, the one that enslaved us, took us into captivity. <clears throat> and they shall drink their own blood as new wine, and shall be drunken. And all flesh shall perceive that I am the Lord that delivers thee, and that upholds the strength of Jacob. Now, let's look at some of the servants that J.C. said that was given to him in the New Testament. Okay? Uh, Titus 1 and 1. Paul, a bond servant. Huh? Jew. A bond servant of J.C. Philippians, <clears throat> here's Paul and Timothy, bond servants of J.C. James, a bond servant of the Most High and the Lord J.C. to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. Well, if, if James had this information, how did he get it? And the Torah prophets, both major and minor, were left out. That wouldn't make any sense at all. That would make the Most High a very incompetent creator. Very unreliable. So this is false. James was never mentioned as a servant and he certainly was not Hebrew or Israel. None of these names that I've mentioned are 
or have ever been proven to be Israel. Based on the names alone, they are more European. Here's Timothy, the Lord's bondservant. 2 Corinthians, bond servants for J.C.'s sake. Timothy again, here is Peter. <clears throat> servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. What? What are you trying to say? That we should enjoy our captivity? I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Servants. Now they're talking about Israel because we just proved who the servants of the Most High was. And Peter is saying, <clears throat> you servants, must be submissive to your masters with all respect. Don't this sound like what a master, a slave master would tell you in order to keep you in check? You know? To keep you in submission? Yeah, that's exactly what they would tell you. In James, a bond servant of the Most High. Well, that's funny because if he was a bond servant of the Most High, why wasn't he mentioned by any of the major or minor prophets in the Torah? Is the Most High forgetful? Did he forget that he had other servants of European descent? I remember in Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> he did have an outside servant, and that was Cyrus. But that was a temporary thing. He used Cyrus to deliver Israel out of Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar. But why weren't these people here ever mentioned in the Torah? It says they were servants. Servants of who? You see, if you look at this carefully, you can realize that this JC has claimed all power that the Most High said he would not give to anybody else. All of this that I've just showed you is what he's doing. He's claiming all the power. Now he's taken these servants, that, which are new, just like the New Testament. And he's operating under his own authority, which he claimed the Most High gave him, which the Most High said, I would never do that. Isaiah 42 and 8. I'm going to remind you, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. So how did J.C. get this power? Where did he get this power? If the Most High said he would not give it to anybody, the only one left is that old devil called Lucifer. <clears throat> That's the only other source of power, which is not real power, but we just saw the most I says, I ain't giving up my power to nobody. But we saw JC said all authority and power was given to him in heaven and on earth. Ain't that what he said? So, who are the real servants of the Most High? Well, let's look at Leviticus. Let's go to the Torah. For the sons of Israel are my...
my servants. They are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. Did the Most High bring Peter, James, Timothy, Paul, any of those people, did they come out of Egypt? But he says, for the sons of Israel are my servants. They are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. Now look at this lie. This is the New Testament, Romans 6 and 22. <clears throat> Y'all really listen to this carefully. But now having been freed from sin. But now having been freed from sin. And enslaved to God. You derive your benefit. Resulting in sanctification. And the outcome eternal life. Okay, let's just examine that for a minute. <clears throat> First of all, the Most High does not enslave anybody. Remember when he created us, he created us with free will. He did not create any robots. We had the freedom to say we choose the Most High. Or we choose another way. Right? So, how can this lie, having been freed from sin, who freed us from sin? Why are we still repenting today? We were told that we should repent daily. And to cease not pray. If we were freed from sin. I mean. Wouldn't that mean that we no longer have to worry about repenting. Uh, even pray. I mean you know we, we're freed from sin. So if we are freed from sin. Then. Why are we waiting on judgment? What are we going to be judged for? This liar, Paul in Romans, just told us that we were free from sin. And now we're slaves to the Most High God. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to... Uh, show y'all something this is a mixture of different and i didn't if i had taken all of these verses and books and chapters down this would have taken forever but i'm pretty sure you guys are sharp enough to get this the highest title of tribute you could give a person in the old testament was to call him the servant of the Most High. The Hebrew word for servant, Eber, Eber, denotes the Most High, given authority as the accredited messenger of the Most High. The servant of the Most High was one who was chosen by the Most High. I have not found Anywhere in the Torah where the Most High chose J.C. It's funny how <clears throat> all the men that he chose, he mentioned them by name. So am I supposed to believe that J.C. was some top secret? And if he was a, a top secret then how would he benefit us? If we don't know of him, 
then we can't serve him. I mean, don't that make sense? So I just don't see how the Most High would have left that out. I don't see it. <clears throat> the Christian do, they some kind of way they can see it. All right. The servant of the Most High was one who was chosen <clears throat> by the Most High. The origin implies the position of a slave. Now don't misinterpret this word under the Most High. Because when you submit to him, you submit to his will, not your own will. That's what this is all about. That's what the laws, statutes, and commandments represent. Servant of the Lord in the Old Testament. Abraham is the servant of the Lord. You can find that in Psalms 105, verse 42. Moses is called the servant of the Most High. And Moses, my servant, more often than anyone else in the Old Testament, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1st Chronicles, uh, 2nd Chronicles, Nehemiah. Moses, the servant of the Most High, is almost the official title of Moses. He was called servant so much. Now, help me make sense out of this. If the Most High was thoughtful enough to mention Moses as his servant this many times, do y'all realize that if I broke each one of these down, <clears throat> how long this list would be? Look at this. And this is just some of them. There is more. There is more. The author of Hebrews described Moses as a servant in the Mosiah's house. When he writes, Moses was faithful in the house as a servant. <clears throat> Joshua, Moses' servant who led Israel into the promised land, was also called the servant of the Most High. At the end of his life, and here's some more, Joshua, Judges, Numbers, First, Second Samuel, First Kings, uh, Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Caleb and King David are called the servant of the Most High. The Most High speaks of his prophets, right? The Most High speaks of his prophets saying I have sent you all my servants the prophets what does all mean every prophet I have I have sent you all my servants the prophets where is JC Remember, J.C. is the backbone in the New Testament. We're going to do a little surgery and remove him. Once we remove J.C., there is nothing the backbone have to hold on to. You just heard what the Mosai said. I have sent you all my servants. The who? The prophets. Isaiah is called the servant of the Most High. Elijah is called the servant. And Job, even Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was called my servant. Now, if he would even mention Nebuchadnezzar as his servant, and he did not mention J.C. once, Wow. The old Babylonian king thought he was king of the hill, but in reality, 
He was only an instrument in the hands of the Most High. The redeemed are his servants, that's Israel, as we would expect according to Psalms. The Most High redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. The nation of Israel was even called the servant of the Most High. <clears throat> Isaiah 41 and 8, we saw that. It is from this servant nation that the Most High sent his suffering servant. Y'all remember Isaiah 53? Here we go. What is he saying? Who is his suffering servant? Right here. Isaiah. Which is including Israel. Israel suffered tremendously and still suffers to this day. And that is what he said or is who he called his servant. So we know the suffering servant that's mentioned in Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel. The Most High called out a people. Huh? The Most High called out a people for himself so that he could provide a redeemer for the world. That people, my friends, is Israel. We're going to prove that. Just stick with me. Y'all know I'll prove everything with scripture. So all of the Most High servants, the prophets, okay, and we just saw up here where he says that I have sent you all of my prophets, my servants to prophets. That means he didn't leave any out. All right, so you can't squeeze JC in there. You cannot do it. If you try it, it makes you a liar, just like the New Testament. All of the Most High's servants, the prophets, speak of the coming of J.C. Now this is a New Testament infiltration. Because how is that possible when right here it says the nation of Israel was even called the servant of the Most High and that the Most High sent his suffering servant who was Isaiah and Israel and up here he says I have sent you all my prophets so that's that's a lie right here right That's a bold-faced lie. It says, all of the Most High servants, the prophets, speak of the coming of J.C. Y'all tell me, which prophet did you hear that called out the coming of J.C.? Because everybody they called out, they were mentioned by name. The Most High said in Amos 3 and 7, Surely I will do nothing lest I show my secrets to my prophets, to my servants. Where was that up here? Let's find that. Now bear with me, y'all. Yeah, 
we get into it. Amos chapter 3 verse 7. For the Most High will do nothing without revealing instruction to his servants, the prophets. Can anybody show me one prophet that told us there was a man coming that was going to die on a, a stick <clears throat> for our sins. Did any, any of the prophets ever say that? Now, if they had said that, then I might believe that. But not one prophet ever said that there was going to be a man coming sent by the Most High to die so we could be freed from sin. But they put that big lie and said that all of Most High's servants, the prophets, speak of the coming of J.C. Wow. These people got some big balls. But I did a lesson on this very subject right here. On this very subject. <clears throat> and I proved by scripture that the prophets were not speaking about J.C. They were prophesying what was going to come regarding Hezekiah. Let's go on. The angel of the Most High called the coming Messiah a servant. Now they're calling it him an, an angel. That's not even scripture. But let's just keep reading. The angel of the Most High called the coming Messiah a servant. Now listen. Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I am going to bring my servant, the branch. The branch is David. That's the branch. I can find scripture all in the Torah that points, as a matter of fact, we're going to run across it. We're going to run across it. But y'all remember this. Remember what, what's said here. Because this is what the Christians try to use to say they prophesy the coming of J.C. All right. So now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I'm going to bring in my servant, the branch. The Most High declares to Isaiah the coming of this same person when he says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. That's in Isaiah 42 and 1. If you understand the scripture and know how to put it in context, it will lead you straight to Hezekiah. The last of the four servant poems of Isaiah presents the exaltation, humiliation, and subs substitutionary sacrifice of extreme exhaustion of the servant Isaiah 52 13 and 53 12 now we just talked about that the suffering servant that's Israel the suffering servant of the Most High is perhaps the highest title in the Old Testament for the Most High Anointed One. 
Who is the Most High's anointed one? As I've shown in past lesson, this is none other but David. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 9 in the Brenton Septuagint. But they shall serve the Most High their God, and I will raise up to them who David their king. Now, to raise up David, we know David's sleeping. So to raise him up would mean to bring him back. So can you see how all of this up here was crap? I mean, JC didn't have nothing to do with this. He's telling you who is dealing with right here. In Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 9, it's telling you, David, their king. That ain't enough. All right, let's go to Ezekiel. Chapter 37, verse 24. Let's get some more. And my servant David shall be a prince in the midst of them. There shall be one shepherd. Okay? There shall be one shepherd of them all. The entire nation of Israel. But I thought it was going to be J.C. Y'all see how they have manipulated the scriptures? The, the Christians? This is why they're so stupid. But I got something I'm going to show y'all in a little bit. It's going to help you really see why Christians are the dumbest people on the planet. And I don't mean that to be offensive. I'm just stating the facts. And I'm going to show it to you in just a little bit. But, and my servant, Ezekiel 37, 24, and my servant, David, shall be a prince in the midst. This is future prophecy, people. This is not past. This is coming. And my servant, David, shall be a prince in the midst of them. There shall be one shepherd of them all, not two. Now, if you put J.C. in the seat that everybody's trying to put him into, this should have been, there shall be two shepherds of them all. But what does it say? There shall be one shepherd of them all. For they shall walk in mine ordinances and keep my judgments and do them. This is speaking of the entering into the kingdom which is coming. This is future prophecy. David's going to be raised up to be our king and he's going to be one shepherd of all of us. That's what he said right here. Most I said that. And my servant David shall be one shepherd of them all. Now, look at this. Let's find some more of uh, the New Testament lies. This is from the New International Version out of the John 3.16 New Testament. Y'all all are very familiar. This is one of the ones we learned first when we was in that Christian uh, fake book. For God so loved the world. Y'all hear that? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But in the Torah, David was called the Most High's son. Solomon was called the Most High's son. And the whole house of Israel was called his son, even his firstborn. If we know that's true, so how can this be true? You see, somebody is lying. It ain't the Torah. So who's lying? That fake, false New Testament. The Most High told us who was his son. Now, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17, the context. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him the path? This is the Torah. Y'all listen to what it says. And taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. He's talking about one drop of water out of a whole bucket full of water. He's saying the nations are as one drop of water out of a whole bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. That's how little those nations mean to him. So with that being said, how can this be true? Y'all get what I'm saying here? This is what the Christians cannot see. They don't have the sense to eliminate the, the fables from the truth. But we do. We're doing it right now. Behold, he taketh up the owls as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations, all nations before him, the Most High, are as nothing. So, again, how can this be true? And they are counted to him less than nothing. You can't get any smaller than that. I mean, that's almost invisible. And vanity. He's telling you right here that this is a lie. That's what he's telling you right here. Because here, the New Testament says, God loved the whole world. And he gave his only son. The Most High says, All nations before him are as nothing. And they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Here's more Torah. The importance of Judaism, sacred text, extends far beyond their religious significance. These ancient, ancient documents embody not only Judaism religious precepts, but also the historical culture and social heritage of the Jew people. In Israel, where attitudes towards tradition range from the ultra-Orthodox to the secular, sacred texts carry a variety of meanings from a spiritual moral 
and practical guide to everyday life, to a historical and cultural wealth which is critically examined and studied. The stories, ideas, and philosophies of the sacred text encompassing millennia of Jews study and thoughts are evident in much of Israel's modern culture. Who? Israel. Which draws on the legacies of the past even as it gives voice to the issues and concerns of the present. The Torah. At the basis of all Jews' sacred texts is what? The Torah. What happened to the New Testament? Why would he leave that out? If that book was so critical to our salvation, why didn't he tell us? He said in Amos 3 and 7, I won't do nothing lest first I tell my prophets, my servants, the prophets. But it looks like something happened. Because the New Testament says something entirely different. At the basis of all Jews, sacred text is the Torah. And in its most basic sense, the Torah is the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, which tell the story of the creation of the world. The Most High's covenant with Abraham and his descendants. The exodus from Egypt the revelation at Mount Sinai where the Mosai enunciated the Ten Commandments, the wanderings of the Israelites in the desert, and a recap recapitulation of that experience shortly before the entrance to the Promised Land. The principal message of the Torah is the absolute unity of the Mosai his creation of the world and his concern for it and his everlasting covenant. All right, now he made an everlasting covenant. That's a done deal. You can't go and make a new book because that changes the covenant. And his everlasting covenant with the people of Israel. The Pentateuch both embodies the heritage of the Jew people, retelling its history, setting forth its guiding precepts, and foretelling its destiny, and carries universal messages of monotheism and social conduct, which have had tremendous impact on Western civilizations. Thus, the Torah is also the origin of certain non-Jews traditions, among them the recognition of the Sabbath as a day of rest. Torah also signifies teaching the, the, the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, the, the Pentateuch itself uses the word Torah to denote a specific body of statutes. Y'all know what the statutes are and y'all know that you can only find them in the Torah, right? In this sense, Torah means law. The New Testament does not mean law and is often so translated generally. While Jewish tradition has throughout the centuries ascribed divine authorship to the Torah, many scholars and modern Jewish thinkers hold that the Torah was compiled incrementally by various authors over a long period of time making it not only the shaper of Jew history, but also its product. 
This means the Torah was and is the only book of law that was given to Israel. There was no second book called the New Testament. There was no need for a second book. The one and only book covered everything. Now, look at this. This will explain why Christians are the way they are. I found this and it both made me laugh and it pissed me off. But I'm going to read this and y'all please pay close attention. This was obviously written by a Christian. So listen to what it says. The New Testament principle is that something from within the spirit flows out to reach others. It is not something from outside of us. That is the Old Testament principle. So what, what are they saying here? They're saying that you should not be reading the Old Testament. Those principles are outdated. Yeah, that's what this is saying. That you should only read the New Testament because the Spirit flows out of you to reach others. So in other words, they don't need the Most High or His Torah or the laws that, that are within it. They can get it from inside of them. Look at what they said. That is the Old Testament principle. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Most High, the Spirit of the Lord, always came upon certain persons. Yeah, it did. And they would speak something for the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Now y'all check this out. Thus saith the Lord is not the principle of the New Testament but of the old. Can you believe this? What do you think they're saying here? Thus saith the Lord is not the principle of the New Testament. In other, in other words, the New Testament is the book of the Most High. It's the new book that he forgot to tell Amos. And all the other major and minor prophets. He forgot to tell them about this book. So those principles. Are, are outdated. But then the Most High says. To say to Moses. To speak to the children of Israel. And say to them. That they should keep this Torah. Throughout their generations. But this is saying something. Just the opposite. Now, check this out. You ain't heard nothing yet. The Christians say, today the enemy, Satan, is trying his best to bring the New Testament believers back to the Old Testament. Did you get that? Today the enemy, Satan, is trying his best to bring the New Testament believers back back to the Old Testament. I don't know what to say about that. When I saw that, I was like, what? And they had the nerve to put that in print? The Old Testament principle of prophesying is thus saith the Lord. And these are the books, chapters, and verses right here. But you cannot find this kind of speaking in the New Testament. Of all the epistles. Written by. The apostles. And not one. Has this tone. Thus saith the Lord. Now that ought to have you standing on your tiptoes. That they have the audacity. To say such a thing. 
For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Paul says, But to the married I charge, but not I, but the Lord. This is the New Testament principle of incarnation. The Lord does not speak from the heavens above us. What? The Lord does not speak. Y'all listen to Paul. The Lord does not speak from the heavens above us, but he speaks within us. Whatever we say, he says with us, through us, by us, and in us. So if somebody walks up and calls you an MF or ass-kissing donkey or a D-sucking minuscule, they're saying that's the most high. It says whatever we say, he says with us. Y'all see how screwed up these people are? Whatever we do, he does it through us and by us. Listen, these Christians go to church on Sunday. Some of them go on Saturday. Now, this is what they call the Sabbath day. Now, clearly, the Sabbath says that there is no work, no cooking, no buying and selling. But then they will leave that church service and go to the nearest restaurant and buy a pork chop dinner. And they want to give you some instruction. They're saying that the most I told them to do this. Whatever we do, he does it through us and by us. Is that not what they said? Huh? He says that. The Lord does. Not speak from heaven above us, but he speaks within us. Y'all listen. Whatever we say, he says with us, through us, by us, and in us. Whatever we do, buying and selling on the fake Sabbath day, he does it through us. And by us. So now they got the most high breaking commandments. His own commandments. Fortunately. The day they keep as Sabbath. Is a lie too. But they say. This is. The New Testament principle. The Catholic Church. Has brought Christianity. Back to Judaism. By mixing. A lot of Old Testament forms. With the things of the New Testament. Maybe that's where the confusion is. Some Christians are trying their best. To bring the New Testament believers. Back to the Old Testament principle. Not in forms. But in certain teachings. And movements. They said that is wrong. Keeping the Torah. Is wrong. That's what they're saying. They're saying keeping the Torah, which the Most High said to do throughout your generation, that means never ending. They said that's wrong. They say we must remain in the New Testament principle. Now do y'all see how they are so messed up? They said the Lord has come down and entered into us. To be one with us. The Most High does not possess people. If that was the case, then why would he give you free will? See how they lie? If you have free will, the mo if the Most High entered you, you would no longer have free will. Right? You would no longer have free will. But they say, the Lord has come down and entered into us to be one with us. 
all the epistles were written in the tone of their writers. That's the problem. And Paul says, I tell you. And Peter says, I tell you. And John says, I say this. It is not I, but Christ. The Lord speaks in me. In the Old Testament, the Lord was an objective Lord. Wow. These people are losing it. They've lost it. Doing things in miraculous ways outside of his people. But today in the New Testament, the Lord is the subjective one. He does not pay attention so much to the outward manifestation. But he pays full attention to the inward working. And they use this crap on Paul having a thorn in his flesh. I'm, I don't even want to read this mess, but I'm going to read it. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, which I believe was a kind of physical suffering in his body. He went to the Lord three times, asking the Lord to remove it in verse 8. But the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. The Lord the Lord would not remove the thorn outwardly, but he would be the sufficient grace to Paul inwardly. Really? After Paul just told all these lies up here? Huh? Paul, but he would be sufficient grace to Paul inwardly. Paul had to learn to experience the Lord himself as the inward grace. That sounds like a Joel Osteen sermon to me. Not the Lord's performing of an outward miracle. That is the New Testament principle. The subtle enemy, Satan, is trying his best to bring the New Testament believers back to the Old Testament time. Do we, now this is what they say, do we want to still be wandering in the wilderness? Of course not. May the Lord be merciful to us and let us come into the rest of the Holy of Holies, into the good land, into the spirit, and learn to know the Christ who is with us in our spirit. My grace is sufficient. But where is the Lord's grace? Galatians 6 and 18 says, The grace of our Lord J.C. be with you, be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Huh? We have to realize that grace is not something outward in miracles and signs. And in physical or material things, the grace of the JC is with and in your spirit. We have the experience, his, we have to experience his grace in our inwardly spirit. Not in something else, they call the Torah something else, y'all. Not in something else, outwardly. They're, they're putting the most out here, y'all. I believe the Apostle Paul is the best example of all believers. We have to follow him. Y'all hear that? They have to follow Paul. Not the most high. We have to be the New Testament believers not the Old Testament people. No wonder why they are so messed up. Never has the Most High possessed anyone, and neither did wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit. Here, Solomon asked for her wisdom, and that she walked with him, not in him. 
The wisdom of Solomon, chapter 9, verse 4. Give me the wisdom that sits by your throne. And do not reject me from among your servants. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 25. For she is a breath of the power of the Most High. He's talking about wisdom. And a pure, pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains interest into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of the Most High, and an image of his goodness. Although she is but one, she can do all things. She's not claiming to be a God. And while remaining in herself, as you can see here, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of the Most High and prophets. For the Most High loves nothing so much as the person who lives with wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun and excels even constellation of the stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior. For it is succeeded by the night, but against wisdom, evil does not prevail. Moses received the Torah. The entire people heard the words of the Most High, and they became frightened. They begged Moses to be the intermediary between the Most High and them. For if the Most High himself will continue to give them the entire Torah, the entire what? Torah, they would surely die. How come he didn't say Torah and my new book? For if the Most High himself would have continued to speak to them the entire Torah, they all would have died. Moses told them not to be afraid, for the Most High had revealed himself to them so that they would fear him and not sin. Then the Most High asked Moses to ascend the mountain, for he alone was able to stand in the presence of the Most High. The, there Moses was to receive the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments and the entire Torah. Where is the New Testament? To teach it to the children of Israel. Moses went up to the mountain and stayed there 40 days and 40 nights without food or sleep. For he had become like an angel during this time. The Most High revealed to Moses the entire Torah. With all its laws and the interpretations thereof. Wouldn't this be the perfect time? Since Moses is leading the Most High's people to let him know that, oh, by the way, I have another book I need to give you. Finally, the Most High gave Moses the two stone tab tables of testimony containing the Ten Commandments written by the Most High himself. <sighs> people... I just, the only thing I can say is, as far as the reason why these Christians, and I'm not going to say all of them, because I've seen some come out of that and come to this channel and are completely seeking the Torah. They have denounced JC, and that's something else I want to bring to your attention. I don't know about you, but when I was a Christian, I asked J.C. to come into my heart. And all the way up until I found this truth, I never denounced him until about a year ago. So what I'm trying to tell you is 
You ask him to come in. Have you asked him or commanded him to leave? If you haven't, I suggest you do. But the reason these Christians, most of them, cannot see what we see is because, just like the Mosai said, I will shut the eyes and the ears of the unbeliever. I will turn them over to the lies. So they will not be able to see, hear, or believe the truth. This is the only explanation I can offer. Shalom.